The Meitner MA3. This deck was loaned to me by one of my supporters for review, thank you very much Philip, and it's an interesting deck for a number of reasons, the biggest of which probably being that it is a pure 1-bit or DSD deck. Now, it's a physically a very large deck with an equally large price tag, costing about 10 grand depending on which region you're in, and for that much money you would hope that it's going to throw some pretty serious punches, which we'll get to that, but let's talk a little bit first about the build. Physically imposing, but with a clean and quite appealing aesthetic, this is in my opinion a very nice looking unit. The machining is precise, the display is big, and even the knob on the front is not made from plastic but instead solid machined metal, something which unfortunately you can't take for granted even on some really expensive products. There's not too much to say about the main body of the unit, it's a fairly standard brush metal finish, but on the back, as well as the usual single-ended and balanced outputs, USB and a variety of synchronous inputs, though no I2S unfortunately, we do also have a network input. The Meitner MA3 has its own built-in streamer, so you can just hook it up straight to your network and stream right to it with Rune. Looking inside the unit, the first thing we notice is it's a bit empty. Now, there are genuine reasons as to why you don't actually need that much stuff inside a 1-bit DAC in particular, which we'll talk about in a sec, but with so much space available, I'm not entirely sure why they went with such a physically massive chassis. It makes it pretty much impossible to use on a desk, and even on certain racks, quite difficult to fit, so definitely would have preferred if they went for a slightly more compact approach. On the right hand side we see a switch mode power supply. Given the price of this unit, it would have been nice to see a linear power supply, though this does seem to be a particularly nice one. This big blue board up here is the digital input board, using an XMOS chip for USB and a small daughter board to provide network streaming functionality. If you look closely, you can also notice that there's a small gap going around the XMOS chip area with some optocoupler ICs, so there is some isolation for the digital inputs built in, which is nice. And this will help to reduce any potential noise that otherwise might be passed through if you were connecting the DAC directly to a beefy PC, for instance, which is a pretty noisy source, and some DACs are quite susceptible to noise from the source. This one, in theory, and in my testing, shouldn't have any issue with that. Then, in the center of the unit is the main digital processing board itself, with a Xilinx FPGA that is handling all of the digital processing, including conversion of incoming PCM and DSD info to DSD1024. The one part that I can't show you is what's under here, i.e. the converter itself. But I do have an image of the actual converter in the Meitner MA1, and I'm presuming that this is going to be very similar, so this seems to be a moving average FIR filter approach. What this basically means is for converting DSD, instead of having a single element that switches on and off at the DSD rate, you instead have a number of equally weighted elements, and the converter itself actually averages the past few samples out. So if you had, let's say, a five element approach, you stream data in until five samples have been loaded, with each output valued at 20% of maximum output. If all the samples were one, the average value that gets output is 100%, if all of them were zero, it's 0%, zero and if three of them were one and two were zero, the average is 60%. The advantage of doing it this way is you are mathematically filtering out a lot of the potential switching noise that would otherwise happen if you were doing a more purist 1-bit approach. If you are doing pure 1-bit single element switching conversion, anytime you have a sample that is not the same as the last one, you switch all the way from 100% to 0%, producing full-scale content at a very high frequency. With this approach, when that new sample comes in, the new current average moves by only 20%, meaning much less noise. This approach doesn't take any computation, it's an entirely physical calculation that acts as a low-pass filter, removing a lot of the switching noise, and because it solves elegantly a lot of the problems with converting DSD, it's used in a lot of products. Other devices like the TNA DAC200 or the Hollow May, for example, use a very similar approach for their DSD converters, although the Hollow May seemingly has quite a few more elements in its converter. So a DSD DAC doesn't actually need to be very complicated in terms of the hardware, the converter itself. If you look inside a typical R2R DAC, for instance, there's usually a lot more going on in terms of hardware because making an accurate R2R DAC is really quite challenging. But whilst the hardware is more difficult, you can then run those with no digital processing whatsoever. The converter itself is natively a PCM converter. It's 16-bit or 24-bit, which means you can just take the PCM samples and convert them exactly as they are. Whereas a Delta Sigma converter, which can be quite simple in hardware, there's even some DIY designs you can have a look at. Uh, there's a few links in the description if you're wanting to learn more about those and how these DACs work. 
They can be more simple in hardware, but the maths, the computation you have to do to take the low sample rate, high bit depth PCM and convert it to high sample rate, low bit depth, well, DSD in a one bit DAC, that can be quite intense. Ideally, you want to have a modulator design that gives you as much dynamic range in the audible band as possible, so below 20 kilohertz, and shapes the quantization noise out to as high a frequency as possible so that the analog filter in the DAC can then just more easily remove it. This can be very compute intensive, and so if you've tried HQ Player or PGGB, for example, with some of their bleeding edge modulators, you'll know that they can bring even the most powerful modern desktop PCs to their knees at higher rates. And even DACs which aren't necessarily pure one bit, but still prioritize a very high performance modulator, like the Core Day, for instance, which quite proudly advertises the fact that its modulator can resolve signals down at or below minus 300 dB, it needs a lot of compute power to do that. The FPGA in the Dave is quite beefy. The one in the MA3 is seemingly a little bit more basic. Doing a quick look at the specs of the FPGA, this one has about 37,000 logic cells. The one in the Chord Mojo 2, for comparison, has about 17,000, so about half as much, though that product is about 5% of the price. The one in the Core Dave, which is similarly priced to the MA3, has 75,000, so twice as many. The MA3 doesn't have much ultrasonic noise, and the noise that it does have is pushed out to a very high frequency, but given the cost of this product, it would have been nice to see it match the performance of cheaper ones such as the TNA DAC200 and the Hollow May. Both of those, when fed with HQ Player for instance, have less ultrasonic noise than this does. That's potentially due to the fact that in the Hollow May in particular, the DSD converter, as mentioned earlier, has a lot more elements in its filter, uh, and so it can be more effective it would have been nice to see the MA3 have a little bit more money, given the price, dedicated to either compute power for the modulator or a slightly more advanced actual converter. And on the note of HQ Player, unfortunately with the MA3 you can't seemingly get an improvement by using HQ Player's DSD modulators instead of the DAC's internal one because it takes any incoming DSD and reprocesses it, as evidenced by the fact that the noise profile did not change at all even when I fed it DSD from HQ Player. And additionally, the digital volume control still works even when feeding it DSD. So a DSD DAC does not need to be as complicated in terms of the actual hardware as other approaches to making a DAC, and there's going to be more invisible costs like R&D. Hiring people who can both design high-performance 1-bit modulators and write quite complex FPGA code ain't cheap, but still, given the price of this product, it would have been nice to see it perform slightly better given as you can get a better result by using cheaper products with HQ Player. I've spent some time with the MA3 both in my speaker system and with headphones, and I've got to be honest, my thoughts are a little bit mixed. There's some things which I really appreciate about this DAC, but I also feel that it comes with some very strong drawbacks. Now, I do not want the takeaway from this video to be that, oh, this DAC sounds bad, because it simply doesn't. This is a very nice sounding DAC, but it's a very expensive product, and so I'm looking at this in comparison to the other products on the market that you can get potentially at far lower prices, and the fact of the matter is that whilst this is a perfectly pleasant sounding DAC, there are other cheaper products that I feel it suffers in comparison to. The first thing that stood out to me when listening to the ME3 was that it's got quite a soft presentation. Transient information feels like it was quite held back, and that did harm perceived detail retrieval, particularly in the treble, to a notable degree. I think a lot of this though is due to the oversampling filter that the MA3 is using. It's using a really slow filter with quite steep roll-off, and that means that at 20 kHz, the frequency response is down by almost 4 dB, so the treble is just plain and simple attenuated. As well as having plenty of aliased content up above that, which could potentially interfere with the performance of downstream components. But both interestingly and frustratingly, this DAC does have two oversampling filters. There's the slower one, which it was using when I was listening to music, but there is another one which is both flatter in frequency response and has a steeper cutoff. The frustrating part is you can't choose to use it. The MA3 has a system that looks at the signal content and chooses which filter to use depending on whether there is high frequency information present. If I play a single 18 kHz sign, we can see that there's nothing above 20 kHz besides the harmonic distortion itself and some noise from the modulator. If I add in a 1 kHz sign as well, it's mostly the same, just a little bit of intermodulation distortion showing. But when I move that second sign up to 1.6 kHz, suddenly the 18 kHz content is attenuated by several dB, and there's also a ton of aliased content because the DAC has swapped to the less effective filter. 
It seems to have a cutoff threshold of about 1.5 kilohertz because if I move that second sign to 1.501 kilohertz, it starts getting confused and keeps switching back and forth between the two filters. I was thinking that maybe this would be something to swap on the fly, depending on when there was a transient present in the music, so to test that, I made a track which had just a single sign playing, then suddenly starts playing another one, and it took the DAC a few milliseconds to actually react to and swap over to the other filter, meaning it wouldn't be able to react to a particular transient or even several transients in the music. It's not quick enough to do that. I also just tried playing and recording several songs through the DAC, and for all of them, it only ever used the slower filter, which makes sense. All music, pretty much, is going to have content above 1.5 kHz, so in anything other than test conditions, it's going to be using the slower filter. Now, I do want to note that this filter doesn't affect distortion performance or anything else, it's just the frequency response and aliasing, but having a $10,000 DAC that doesn't have the option to have a flat frequency response is pretty disappointing. If you have an MA3, I would recommend turning on oversampling in your player. Rune, Ordovana, and Fubar all have options for this available, and just using the stock Rune oversampling, to me, sounded considerably better than just letting the DAC do it itself. This also seemed to have a bit of a negative effect on soundstage. The width of the stage on this DAC is fine, but the frontal depth and layering ability was not particularly great. This also then leads into a related issue, which is when playing busier tracks. Pliny, for example, is an artist that I absolutely love that's got some tracks with quite a lot going on at once, the MA3 really struggles to separate things. It's hard to listen to just one particular element and hear it clearly. Everything's a little bit smeared and blended together, and the sense of black ground is just not really there. A being the MA3 with Pliny's Impulse Voices versus either the Hollow May or the Ferrum Wandler, both of these two did a much better job there. The sense of background and things just floating in space, rather than having more of a wall of sound in front of you, was significantly better on both of those DACs compared to the MA3. But there is something which this DAC does which a lot of people are going to like, and that is mid-range texture. The tactility of the stuff that makes up the timbre of vocals and instruments is a bit more prominent than on other DACs like the Wonder and the May, and this makes stuff like the strings in Surge by Reed Willis just great. Grinworthy. If you have a particularly heavy priority for things like vocal timbre, this is absolutely something about this DAC that you are going to like. It's a slightly warmer and softer presentation overall, but it draws your attention to the more incisive and textual elements of the mid-range more than other sources. And the same goes for bass contents. As we go down lower in frequency, listening to something like Murmuration by Gogo -Go Penguin, the upright bass in that track is just fucking groovy, and much more vividly and prominently presented than something like a Rock and Away Dream or a Hollow May would give you. When talking about the bass though, we have to sort of loop back around a bit because a lot of bass elements, like kick drums, have transient elements. A kick drum is not all low frequency content, especially that leading edge, that's quite a strong high frequency transient. And the problem is that, as said, the MA3 has a bit of a soft presentation to it. So listening to songs like Don't Be Scared by Bensley and comparing to the Ferrum Wandler or the Hollow May, or even some cheaper decks like an Eversolo DAC Z8, it's not really a fair fight. Those decks are all harder hitting, snappier, faster sounding, and more impactful. The MA3's presentation sounds slightly more damped, even with external oversampling turned on, and so listening to something like the drum solo in Contact by Daft Punk, if you were to put the MA3 up against a Rockner Wave Dream, it's not even really in the same league, and it's just not as engaging as you would want it to be. The MA3's presentation is fairly safe, and this does mean that it's kind of anti-sibilance in a way. You're going to find that it's not particularly susceptible to things like uh, harsher elements in poorly mastered tracks, sibilance in and of itself. It helps to tame that kind of stuff, but it comes at the drawback of meaning that for tracks where you want the energy, engagement, and hard-hitting stuff, it just can't get as energetic as you would want it to be, and definitely falls behind other decks. Even when I was using HQ Player to feed exactly the same digital information at 192kHz to both the May and the MA3, playing Maria by Shagabond, the Hollow May was tighter, faster, harder hitting, and an overall better experience. The MA3 does still have some of that texture advantage on certain acoustic tracks, but if you listen to any kind of electronic music in particular, you're probably going to find that the MA3 is not going to give you what you want. So the detail retrieval on this DAC is fine, but not great across the full spectrum, and certainly not as good as I feel it should be given the price. It does have a mid-range texture presentation that many people are going to prefer over many other products, 
but it comes with significant drawbacks. The staging is limited, the ability to separate and hold up during busier passages of tracks is a weak point, and the excitement dynamic factor is a weak point too. It's not able to be as punchy and hard hitting as a lot of tracks would demand. The ME3 has a safe, softer presentation, which does help for certain poorer recorded tracks. If you mostly listen to metal and rock, this might work quite well. But I can't help but be left feeling that this deck is not really worth the money unless the colorations that this provides happen to very carefully cater to your particular preferences. However, even if that is the case, in the later stages of reviewing this deck, I was comparing quite a bit to the shit Yggdrasil OG, because I thought that it shared some similarities to this. That deck also shares some of the same limitations as the MA3, in particular the fact that the sound stage is a little bit limited, but what it does not share is that softness aspect. Compared to the MA3, the Yggdrasil is much slammier, harder hitting, with more incisive sounding treble, but retains that mid-range texture presentation, and is about a quarter of the cost of the MA3. In the later stages of reviewing and comparing the ME3 directly to the shit Yggdrasil OG, I ended up outright preferring the shit Yggdrasil OG. Both of these decks are slightly too coloured for me to want to use as my only or main deck, although that's specific to the Yggdrasil OG variants. The LIM, for instance, is much more neutral and get subscribed because I've actually got a video reviewing all of the Yggdrasil variants in one video coming in a couple weeks' time. But if wanting this direction of coloration, I think the Yggdrasil does it better for about 20% of the cost. It has that mid-range texture prominence, a slightly intimate presentation, but the Yggdrasil was more resolving in the treble and able to excite and deliver the sense of impact more for tracks that needed it, whereas the MA3 was a little bit on the pillowy side. If this deck was three or $4,000, I'd have been much more positive about it. This is not a bad sounding deck. I've enjoyed listening to it and it's perfectly fine, but, when there are products from various manufacturers at well under half its RRP that I feel outperform it in multiple areas, regardless of whether you're looking for something more neutral and transparent like a Wanda or a May, or something with a little bit more coloration but fewer drawbacks like a Yggdrasil OG, it unfortunately becomes quite hard to recommend. If you wanted to talk about this review or anything else related to music or gear, then join my Discord server. And if you're feeling generous, then support me on Patreon and get access to the private supporters only Telegram chat. A huge thank you to my crazy Summit Fight tier supporters, Dan Mellinger and Jiden the Shiba, my Legend tier supporter, Anthony37, and my Diamond tier supporters, Naivotsu, CK Yozizawazu, Eminent One, Neil Snyder, and Spelliofool. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.